today on Let the Bible Speak. Jesus said the ancient temple in Jerusalem would be left desolate or empty. Why? And is there a warning for us today? Stay with me for that study next. From the Churches of Christ, Let the Bible Speak with Kevin Presley. And thanks for joining us today. It's a privilege to have another day and another opportunity to share with you in the Word of God. The temple was the center of Jewish life and religion. Although the temple standing in Jesus' day was not the original one built by Solomon hundreds of years before, the temple that then stood was still considered by the Jews to be God's house and His dwelling among them. So you might imagine the reaction when in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 38, Jesus uttered this shocking prediction. He said, Behold, your house, speaking of the temple, is left unto you desolate. Why would Jesus predict the demise of what was considered the house of His Father? Well, there's an important spiritual lesson in it for them and for us, and I want us to consider it together today, and I'll be back with that study in a moment after a song. If you'd like to dig deeper into the Word of God, I'd like to provide you with a great opportunity to do that, and it's free I hope to hear from you today enrolling in our Bible Correspondence course. You don't need to feel overwhelmed by the Bible. If you don't know how to study the Bible or where to begin in reading the Bible, this course will help get you on track and it'll answer some very, very important and fundamental questions about the Bible and what the overall message is about. And uh, when you enroll in the course, we send out the first lesson. You take the time to read through it and answer the questions. You send it back to us. We'll uh, check it and send it back along with the next lesson in the course. You do it in the privacy of your home at your own pace. And again, it is free. So let us hear from you today, and we will enroll you in the Bible Correspondence Course. Connect with us on social media. Go to Facebook.com and search for Let the Bible Speak TV. To a world steeped in darkness of sin and despair, the Lord God in mercy sent someone to care. We needed a Savior, our guilt to erase. So Jesus came to die in our place. Ancient Israel had the unique privilege of interacting with God in a direct and personal way. First, His Shekinah glory was among them in the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire that led them away from Egypt and toward the Promised Land. He then took up His residence between the two cherubim on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. This was in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle that Moses had constructed. 
And as time passed, David eventually became the king and he wanted to build God a house, according to 2 Samuel chapter 7, a permanent dwelling. Well, the task fell to David's son because David was a man of war. Solomon, when he became the king, constructed a magnificent temple. When the new temple was dedicated, God's presence entered and filled the place and it literally became the house of God. It was God's dwelling amongst the Israelites. And this holy place became sacred and hallowed to the nation and uh, their national and religious life revolved around it. Uh, Psalm 122 and verse 1 captures the thrill of that place when the psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. But that temple had a long and varied history throughout the life of the nation. The glory days of the Davidic and Solomonic Empire did not last. Sin and idolatry entered the picture and the nation went astray. When Solomon died, the kingdom under the leadership of his incompetent and haughty son Rehoboam was divided. And in a matter of time, the temple was destroyed and the Jews carried off to Babylon as slaves. Well, they were finally allowed to return and they attempted to rebuild their beloved temple, but it really was a meager effort. The next several hundred years marked the total loss of Israel's independence and their being occupied by different world powers, ending with the Romans by the time of the first century. The political and religious state of Israel was in a sorry state when Jesus was born. Their political misfortunes had changed their hopes of a Messiah to be nothing more than a political revolutionary of some kind who would solve their problems through political and social means. Consequently, their religion was corrupted by politics and materialism until by this point their worship was merely a formality and it was an empty shell of ritualism. God simply was not in it. The temple no longer represented what it once had because God's glory had departed long ago. Early in His ministry, Jesus, you may recall, ran the money changers out of the temple, accusing them of making His Father's house into nothing more than a house of merchandise, John chapter 2 and verse 16. Three years later, the situation was no better, and Jesus a second time entered the temple, and He threw out the unscrupulous and greedy money changers and overthrew their tables. And He quoted the Scriptures to them, saying, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. That's recorded in Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 and 13. Meanwhile, the Jewish leaders had already been plotting to kill Jesus. And according to John chapter 11 and verse 48, listen carefully as they said amongst themselves, If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. Later, as Jesus looked at Jerusalem, once the city of God and the temple, once the house of God, He said in Matthew 23 and verse 38, as we read in the beginning, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Jesus prophesied the city and the temple's destruction. To His own disciples, He said just three verses later, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 2. Well, indeed, within 40 years during the Jewish war, Titus and his Roman forces decimated the temple and the city. In AD 70, Jerusalem was laid waste and the center of their Jewish life and worship was forever gone. But did you notice the change of expression in regard to the temple? Notice that Jesus called it God's house. The Old Testament scriptures identified it as God's house. But they called it our house. And then Jesus finally says, your house is left to you desolate. What that means is what once was a holy place where God dwelt and reigned had become by this time a profane place used for their own purposes. Their religion was empty and hollow and it was ineffectual. And they looked upon the temple by this time really as their own possession, at least they treated it that way, to do with as they pleased. Their religion was no longer about pleasing God and obeying God, but instead it was for their own personal agendas, ambitions, and self-aggrandizement. No longer did the law of God regulate their worship and the practices of the temple, but rather the traditions of their fathers ruled the day. And so it had ceased to be God's house, and now they viewed it as their house. 
Jesus, who was the ultimate manifestation of God in their midst, you see, he stood in the way of their purposes, and so in their minds he must be eliminated. So Jesus simply says, so be it. This is no longer God's house because God had left it. And since God was no longer there, it was marked for destruction. Well, there are some lessons there for us. You know, first, God has a house today in which He dwells, and that house is the church. Not a physical structure, not a building somewhere, but the congregation of His people. Paul reminded the Corinthians, Know ye not that ye, that is the church, are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, that is again the church, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy. Which temple ye are? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Paul also once told Timothy concerning the assembly of the church, These things write I unto thee, that you may know how you ought to behave in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. So you see, Paul says the house of God is the church of the living God. Now that being the case, we would do well to remember that the church is the house of God, and it is not our house. It is Christ's church. It doesn't belong to us. And therefore it is not our prerogative to operate it however we wish and to do within it whatever we please. But yet we hear many today talk of my church or your church or this church or that church, but not the Lord's church. Now first of all, since the Lord has a house, it is His house. Psalm 127 and verse 1, uh, the psalmist said, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. You see, you and I don't have a right to build a spiritual house. That authority belongs to Christ and He alone. During His earthly ministry, Jesus promised His disciples upon this rock, I will build my church. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. Now first of all, He said nothing about building many churches. He didn't give authority to those men to build their own churches. Neither did He grant that power to any man who would come later. Uh, for example, Martin Luther, he was not given the authority to build a church. Neither was John Calvin or John Knox. Uh, King Henry VIII didn't have God's permission to build a church. John Wesley, John Smith, nor any other religious leader was ever given the right by God to build a church. Jesus alone was given that power, and that's all He did build was one, and it is His. Now today, religious people are divided into a seemingly innumerable myriad of religious bodies and organizations holding to different doctrines and worshiping according to their own creeds and traditions, wearing all manner of unscriptural, unbiblical names, and practicing all kinds of things that are simply not authorized in the New Testament. Now friend, all of that is not of God. He never said anything about building a thousand and one churches. And He never made any allowance for men and women to take it upon themselves to do so either. The Lord has one house. He built one house and He yet today only has one house. Now, not only did He build His own house, but He is its ruler and its head. Again, it is His house. Colossians 1 and verse 18 says, And He, Christ, is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have the preeminence. Now, Jesus is the head of the church, and if it is His house, shouldn't it follow His word in all things? Shouldn't He have the say for what goes on within it and not us? Doesn't He have the ultimate authority? You see, when Jesus established the church, He placed within it what He desired. He didn't leave it incomplete. And He didn't leave it up to you and me to furnish it however we please. He placed within it the things He desired. And only He had the right, the power, the authority to do that. Uh, even the apostles only spoke and directed the church as they were guided by Christ to do so. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 1, says, Be ye followers of me. Paul says, Be followers of me, even as I, Paul, am also of Christ. You see, they could only follow Paul in so much as Paul followed Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, he says, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. Paul said, We're not at liberty to do as we please. But we're ordered to do what Christ commanded us to do in the way that He commanded us to do so. Now that's why we so strongly insist on following the commands and examples of the New Testament. 
That's why we refuse to accept the unending parade of innovations that people have introduced into religion down through the centuries. That's why our worship is simple and primitive, because Christ is its author and the church is His house. You might ask, uh, why don't you people worship with an instrument? If you've ever visited a, an assembly of the Church of Christ, you have probably very well noticed that we uh, do not worship with mechanical instruments of music, and sometimes people wonder, why is that? Is it just to be different? Uh, no, it's not just to be different. It's because the church that Jesus built didn't do so. It was absent for 600 years from the time of the church's establishment. You say, well, well, why don't you have Sunday schools? And why don't you uh, uh, get up with the times and how you serve the Lord's Supper? Or don't you see that you're on the wrong side of history, not allowing women to be preachers and elders and so forth? But my friend, those aren't our decisions to make. The Word of God already spoke about those matters. And you see, it's His house, and it is not ours. By Jesus' day, the commands of God and even the ceremonies of Moses were largely forgotten in the temple, certainly corrupted, long since supplemented, or even replaced by the traditions of the Jews that had evolved through the centuries since the law came through Moses. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15, beginning in the 8th verse, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Now, was it simply the, the fact that their worship was uh, insincere? Is that what he means when he says their heart is far from me? No, there's more to it than that. He said, he goes on, he says, In vain they worship me because they teach for doctrines the commandments of men. Their hearts were far from Christ because they were giving preference to their own desires and traditions and their own will instead of following the law of God the Word of God. Now the same can be said in religion today. The so-called Christian world is covered over with doctrines and practices that are totally foreign to the church revealed in Scripture. Have you really stopped to think about how true that is? Have you ever really investigated where all of these things that are so prevalent in religion today came from? We recently had a series some months back on innovations in religion. I hope that you'll go online and look that up and that you'll watch those lessons because we deal with that in great detail, at least some of the things that we had time to get to. Uh, many people have never really stopped to think about the origin of these things. And the fact is they didn't come from God, they came from man after Jesus built His church. Can that be said of the church with which you assemble to worship? Have the traditions of men replaced the traditions of the Lord? because we are to keep the traditions or ordinances that were originally authored by the Lord and given through the apostles, and we're to do so in the way that they were given, not adding to, taking from, changing, rearranging. We're to do it as the Bible says to do it. That's a command of the Scripture. Now, not only its practices, but the teachings of the church. Well, what does it say about our mentality, for example, concerning the house of God when we hear of churches and religious bodies voting on theological and doctrinal matters. Sometimes you hear of denominations that come together in a convention or they come together in some annual meeting or regular meeting and uh, they take some uh, social issue or some doctrinal issue and they weigh that and they basically come to a vote as to whether that denomination is going to recognize that doctrine or they're going to preach that doctrine or they're going to enforce that doctrine, whether to accept this or that or recognize these marriages or those or whether to include this teaching or that teaching. Friends, the church of Christ is the pillar and ground of the truth, Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. And that means there is no voting on the truth. There is no voting on the truth. We either accept, preach, and practice the truth, or we reject the truth. Now, it's as simple as that. The truth itself never changes. And it's not up to us to determine whether it's truth or not. It's up to us to either follow it or reject it. And if we reject it, then sadly we're not followers of Christ. You see, the supposed church has become our house in many cases instead of God's house. Uh, our attitude about the house of God can not only be seen by what goes on within it, but even by what it's called. Friend, doesn't it stand to reason that if Christ built His house, that if Christ is the head of His house, that if Christ even died and shed His blood to purchase that house, 
as Paul affirmed in Acts 20 and verse 28, that it should be called his house, that we should refer to it as his house. You know, we've already pointed out that we get in the habit of talking about my church and your church or their church, this church, that church, but what about the Lord's church? There's a prophecy about the church in Isaiah chapter 62, and there God said that He would call the Gentiles and that He would establish a new name in the earth. And speaking of this new Israel in Christ, Isaiah chapter 62 and verse 2 says, And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all kings thy glory, and thou shalt be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord shall name. You see, the name by which His kingdom would be called, and that's talking about the dispensation in which we live, that name would be given by Him, not by us. Well, first of all, His house has a name, and that name is given by the Lord, and that name is Christ. After the gospel was preached to the Gentiles, starting with Cornelius, the Bible says in Acts 11 and verse 26, the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. The disciples were called something, but they weren't just called anything. They were called Christians, followers, disciples of Christ. They wore His name. And you hear people today say, well, names don't matter. It doesn't matter what you call the church or how you refer to the church. It's still the church. But if it's the Lord's church, why don't we call it the Lord's church? Why isn't it Christ's church? The church was identified with Christ from the very beginning. It was and it is His church. Is it strange then that Paul simply referred to congregations of God's people in Romans 16 verse 16 by saying, The churches of Christ salute you? You see, that's not merely a sign over the door. That's not a man-made name or designation. It's a divine description of the church, of the house of God. The churches of Christ because they are united under the headship and lordship of Christ and Christ alone. Why would we want to call the church by a name belonging to one besides Christ? As we noted, Martin Luther didn't build a church, nor did any other man or woman. Jesus did. Why would we call the church by some name that accentuates division when we refer to the church by some doctrine that it puts emphasis upon in contradistinction to others? Isn't that just highlighting, highlighting and sanctioning the division that exists in today's world? You see, the church is Christ's body. It is His house. Every true and faithful congregation of His church is united under His headship and under the authority of His teaching and His Word. So why refer to it as something else or as though it belongs to somebody else or pertains to something else? It is the Lord's house or has it become our house? You know, God had nothing to do with the temple by the end of Jesus' ministry. His Shekinah glory had departed. Their sacrifices were ineffectual. Their prayers were unheard. Their gifts were useless. Their piety was pointless. Their worship a waste because they were not worshiping in God's house. They had made it their own. It was therefore their house and no longer God's house. Oh, they talked about God and they claimed to worship and serve God, but God was not there. And could it be that the many conflicting religions in our world today are Christless religions, having rejected His authority and His way for our own I would remind you that Jesus said, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Luke 6 and verse 15. And the Savior said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let us honor God's house. May it always be God's house in word and deed and in practice.
The psalmist said, Through thy precepts I get understanding. The Bible is the revelation of God to man. And you simply can't live for God until you know something about the Word of God. And you may say, well, I want to read and study the Bible, but I don't know where to begin. I feel overwhelmed or I don't understand the Bible. I want to offer you a wonderful way to get acquainted with the Scriptures. You'll learn about some of the most basic and foundational teachings of God's Word, and you'll get a better handle on how to read and approach and study the Bible as a whole. Won't you get in touch with us today and ask to be enrolled in the Bible Correspondence Course? It won't cost you a penny, and we'll mail the lessons to your home, and you take your time to read and study through the lessons. I think you'll be surprised how much you'll learn. Connect with us on social media. Go to Facebook.com and search for Let the Bible Speak TV. It's always a pleasure to spend this time with you in Bible study, and I appreciate you for taking the last 30 minutes to open up the Word of God with me. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, a printed transcript, it's free of any cost whatsoever. We'll be happy to send it to you. Just get in touch with us and ask for the lesson, A House Left Desolate, and that will be on its way. Don't forget also you can enroll in our Bible Correspondence course for free. We have a podcast that you can subscribe to so you never miss the program. Uh, just simply go to uh, iTunes or Google Play and search for Let the Bible Speak TV and sign up, subscribe, and you'll receive the uh, program right to your digital device each week and you can listen on the go. Thank you for joining us today. I hope that you'll make your plans to join us in worship very soon, that you'll visit a congregation of the Church of Christ near you. Uh, we hope you'll tell someone else about the program in the coming days and make your plans to join me back here next week for another study from the Word of God. Until then, I pray the Lord will bless you with a wonderful week. We'll see you next time. Bible Speak is brought to you by your friends in the Churches of Christ.